human growth hormone secretagogues, Samorlin and Ibutamorin, MK677, used by millions and millions of people worldwide and more so every day because these agents truly increase muscle mass and they burn fat. They're used more and more by recreational bodybuilders, not so much the real top pros and men that use excessive steroids because this drug is an alternative to growth hormone. And these men are just using growth hormone directly. So that's the scope in the market for this, secretagogics. They're an alternative to growth hormone. These drugs are used more and more by the common person, both men and women, and they're used more and more in anti-aging rejuvenation clinics. And it's amazing that I see traditional physicians also feeling more comfortable in prescribing this, and we'll talk about that. These human growth hormone secretagogues are thought to be cheaper, softer, safer, and more sustainable than human growth hormone. We'll see if it's true. Both of these secretagogues mediate in the central nervous system by slightly different mechanisms, and I'll compare them and contrast them today. Samorlin. First developed in the early 1980s by scientists, approved by the FDA in 1997, and given a patent to Serrano Pharmaceuticals. The mechanism of action is, this is a synthetic analog of endogenous hormone, releasing hormone. It's actually only the first 29 amino acids of the full 44 amino acid structure. And that is enough to stimulate true growth hormone, and of course, conversion to IGF-1 in a human being. It does work. There's a lot of studies on this. The clinical uses of Samorlin, initially to diagnose failures and lesions, if you will, in an intact hypothalamus pituitary growth hormone axis. So this is used to detect if someone's axis in the hypothalamus and pituitary is producing growth hormone adequately detection. The other clinical use and more commonly known is growth hormone deficiency in children. Now, this company produced this at the time in the late 1990s and they competed with recombinantly produced injectable human growth hormone. That was the market. And after 10 years, in 2008, they discontinued production of this because they could not compete in the marketplace with real, recombinantly produced human growth hormone. So currently, it's not a trade name drug anywhere in the world. It's produced though and manufactured by compounding and manufacturing pharmacies all over the world in the generic form, which is called Samorlin. The clinical uses of Samorlin that I see by common people. You'll see it at the anti-aging facilities and you'll also see it more commonly occurring, being prescribed by traditional physicians more and more. Now, the first issue I bring up is, and of course, this is because they're using it as an alternative to human growth hormone. There's gotta be legal risk. It's very amazing to me that these doctors, many doctors would never prescribe growth hormone because the federal statute indicates that it's illegal to prescribe growth hormone for bodies, for improving a body form and function. You have to have a tactical diagnosis of adult growth hormone deficiency syndrome. And there's a very specific set of criteria for diagnosing that. So doctors, of course, give growth hormone in this country because they're, they're just taking risks. They're taking a risk. And they feel that that's appropriate and they do it. So the other doctors and even some primary care doctors that I know are prescribing this because they feel it's an alternative to growth hormone. It's not growth hormone, so it's safer to prescribe legally. We will see about that. Very interesting. The mechanism of action that makes it so incredibly interesting is that it's not growth hormone and it's mediating through your endogenous growth hormone by stimulating your anterior pituitary to produce your own growth hormone. Now, 
in the end, theoretically, you're maintaining your intact system. You're tickling it, but you're maintaining it. And in the end, there's going to be more of a control on it. Your hypothalamus pituitary growth hormone IGF-1 axis versus just injecting exogenous growth hormone. And we're going to see less side effects. That's the whole idea here. It's amazing. And there's literature on this and there's tons of clinical data. So it's specifically going to be lessened in effect adversely at affecting diabetes, prediabetes. So it's less adverse in growth hormone on insulin. Thyroid function, not to impair and interact with other aspects of your pituitary function. Thyroid function, cortisol function, glucagon function, FSH, LH, prolactin function, sexual pathways and limbic pathways, peripheral neuropathy and carpal tunnel. In theory, it will not cause carpal tunnel because it's not as strong as real growth hormone, certainly when you use a certain amount of growth hormone. And that overall body edema and that distended gut that we see with GH. So it seems like it's true, but again, is it sustainable? Is it safe? The side effects of Samorlin. First off, on the box, it's injected, so you can see some injection site reactions with anything that's injected. Next, you see warnings on CNS effects, like people that have epilepsy, and they talk about obesity. They talk about people that have elevated glucose levels, prediabetes and diabetes, and elevated triglycerides. Now, there's no specificity on this. It just gives warnings across the board. I wonder if you're obese, which so many people are technically, is this going to help or is it going to impair the uptake and the effect of this drug? Or is there actually dangerous warnings on this over time? I could not find any details on this and, and um, clinical studies on this. Next, uncontrolled hypothyroidism is a warning to not use it with someone who has this significantly uncontrolled hypothyroidism. And interestingly enough, it appears like in clinical studies, people develop antibodies to Samorlin. Now, I don't know, and it appears like no one really knows what the end outcome will that may be. Will it just minimize the effect and the sustainability of the drug, or is there some danger? We don't know. Now, what I've seen anecdotally over the last 10 years of a physician taking care of people that are using these agents. First off, I think it has a limited effect. I think it works, but I think it's a limited effect because my patients tell me that, you know, doc, in the beginning, I definitely felt something. I felt a little bit muscle and I felt some burn off of my fat um, and it went away. How long does it go away? Seems like after three to six months. But I've seen people on this for about a year or two, and it seems like they just people just stop using it. I just don't know why. They just feel it's not working anymore. They have to reset or they just stop using it. Uh, usually not because they can't afford it, because it's pretty cheap. So I do see potential depression and anxiety. I'm just going to state what I see anecdotally. My allergy is in soft tissue injury, some edema, but not much compared to real uh, big doses of growth hormone. But what I see anecdotally is I don't see effects of blood pressure. I don't see effect on clinical labs like CBC, lipids, and I don't see an uptick in coronary artery disease, stroke, or impairments in metabolic function that I do with real steroids and, of course, human growth hormone. Now let's move on to ibutamorin. MK677. Now, this is not a, uh, a drug that's been approved by the FDA. It has investigational drug class status at the moment. And as of June 2017, uh, it has preclinical trials that are going on for growth hormone deficiency. That's all you could find. This is another growth hormone secretagogue. It's an oral agent. It came about in 1995. And it falls under the family of growth hormone releasing peptides, GHRP. Now, there are many of these. That's why I'm doing this video to compare and contrast the two most common growth hormone secretagogues, if you will. So it's amazing that the mechanism of action of the GHRP class are that it stimulates ghrelin. It increases 
ghrelin stimulation in the central nervous system. What is ghrelin? Ghrelin is the hunger hormone. It's made in the GI tract and it will increase when the stomach is empty. And what that does upon many other aspects in the body, it increases appetite. It's also a regulator, if you will, of energy homostasis. And it has wide effects in the hypothalamus. In the hypothalamus, in the brain, it stimulates ghrelin GH secretagogue receptors. That's what they're called. And of course, downstream, it increases growth hormone. But you see, this is a different way to getting increased growth hormone than Samorlin. Ibutamorin is a very potent oral stimulator of growth hormone and of course IGF-1. And in studies, we see a sustained elevation of up to 24 hours of growth hormone and IGF-1. The side effects of this drug, because it's so important that this is not a true prescribed drug, so we don't know so much about it, but it's being widely used. Number one side effect, everyone's gonna agree, appetite. It stimulates appetite, as we spoke, that through mediating through the, the ghrelin stimulation in the brain. And this can have deleterious effects because if you're using it to build muscle and burn fat and you're eating so much, obviously it's gonna work against itself and you're gonna have a poor outcome. Next, the other aspects that I compare to Samorlin are that it's not as tightly regulated, it seems, and it has spillover, if you will, and it causes other effects on other hormones in the body. And those hormones will be cortisol, leading to edema and adrenal effects, increase in blood pressure, total body edema, prolactin. I see people complaining anecdotally that they have a worsened sex drive and libido issues with this drug, particularly tiredness. Now, what else do I see coming in the clinic? I see definitely the appetite issue, that's big. And for men that wanna get big and strong and eat more food, this is a good drug for that. Otherwise, we definitely see increased edema, and with that, I see an increase in blood pressure. Again, these drugs are used widely with so many other drugs, it's very difficult to determine is it the drug itself, because it's not a controlled setting for a study. I see increase in anxiety, I see palpitations, and I see increase in heartburn, in GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And I definitely see what I believe is an uptick in prediabetes impaired fasting glucose, as it seems like it does affect uh, a person's endogenous insulin. I don't necessarily see any other lab changes with CBC, comprehensive metabolic panel, or lipid panel, or on the thyroid TSH, or direct thyroid panels. Other notes with this amazing secretagogue. I do see bodybuilders using this as PCT for when they come off of large doses of growth hormone. I wanna get out, I wanna send this out there. I'm amazed that people in the fitness business, you know, they love using all these medicines and they love to feel that they're getting some value out of this and hopefully staying safe. So you see this is PCT for human growth hormone. Could you imagine PCT for HGH using some of these secretagogues? It's amazing. Now, my concerns with these two secretagogues, not to mention all other secretagogues for human growth hormone, not to mention all drugs, is it sustainable? It definitely increases muscle, it appears, and it burns some fat. Now, you're gonna have side effects depending on what drug. Always side effects are gonna limit the utility of a drug. There is appetite, there is edema, there is effects on libido. Now, those are kind of quality of life effects other effects that we worry about. Now, I could compare these two drugs to human growth hormone. Cancer. Do we see, in the end, sustainable IGF-1 that you want? That's what you want. You want an IGF-1 to be sustained. When I talk to the best doctors in the world that are oncologists, experts in treating cancer, they're concerned for sustained IGF-1 for decades, if indeed it actually does sustain IGF-1 for decades and you're getting this beneficial effect. Are you gonna have an uptick in cancer? If you, as you get older, you're gonna have potential cancer. As people get old, one of the risks for cancer, for all cancers, theoretically, are as you get older, 
it gets worse. Colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. As you get older, the risks go up. If you have that cancer in your body and you're on an agent that's increasing IGF-1, I just think, is it worth it? Can it spurn on and manifest that cancer? We have to think about this. There are no studies on this and we need to see studies on this. Next, long-term effects on the metabolic system, on the cardiac system, on the, the growing your heart, anything that grows a muscle tissue, you have to worry is gonna grow your left ventricle and cause production of plaque in the artery, potentially destabilizing it and causing a heart attack. So with that said, I hope this video is educational. It's so complicated and so new and novel. And I just have to say, if you're using these agents, please get monitored by a physician. No physician is ever gonna know about these because I don't know about these. No one can know about these drugs. You have to be careful and conservative. And if you wanna take risks, please be careful and get monitored. And at the end of the day, go see a physician that really truly cares for you and see a physician that you feel comfortable in and confident knows what he or she is doing. I hope this helps, thank you so much. Dr. Thomas O'Connor here. I'm glad you made it to the end of the video. If you liked it, hit the like button and please subscribe to our channel. And I look forward to bringing you more cool and interesting videos just like this in the future. Stay strong and healthy.